So hi guys, I'm really excited to be here today. This is my first Google Talk. And I'm very excited to be talking about fashion with my friend, Jason Wu. Um, he's a very creative and talented designer, one of the best in the world. So um, let's get started. Sure. We've known each other for about five years now, right? Yeah. It's like, uh, it seems like forever ago. I know, it's crazy. It's like, Next year is my 10th anniversary, so. And you did, you definitely didn't even have three lines when I met you. No, so now I have like a thousand jobs. Then. So it's yeah. like, it was like a much more innocent time. Um, so the most. <laughs> <laughs> I love this camera. I can oh. see which angle I look better. He <laughs> <laughs> does better. Less fat. <laughs> He's not vain, I promise. <laughs> Um, so the most recent time that we hung out was for the launch for your gray Jason Wu line. Yeah. That was a really fun dinner. I had such a good time. Cute. Um, how did, let's talk first about how you started your career in fashion and what inspired you. Yeah, I mean, I started around uh, 10 years ago when I was 23. And, uh, and I, I kind of just, I left school and... Uh, which means I did not graduate. <laughs> it was a nice way of saying it. But, um, and I just really wanted to like get my hands dirty and really work. You know, I was always just been like really curious about how everything worked. And I, I like to, you know, I'm not the kind that likes to read instruction manuals very much. Like I just kind of want to do things and try it out. Yeah. So that's kind of what I did. I went into the industry, um, really didn't know that much. I had interned before, but I didn't wow. really know so much about the ins and outs of fashion and yeah. how complicated everything was. So, you know, it was definitely like a, you know, it definitely was trial by fire yeah. going to the industry. But, you know, I would say the one great thing about it is that I think um, I can say now, like, I've done every job that exists in my company, which is um, really nice because to, to be able to really have that understanding, even if I'm not doing everything. That's impressive. You had to learn everything on your own. Yeah, I mean, I remember like carrying like big paper patterns down Seventh Avenue. Wow. And then like you know getting them graded, and then we were like, oh, you know, like in school you only have to make like one sample. And we're like, oh, we didn't know like we have to do like different sizes, and different <laughs> things, like all those things, you know, like big learning curve. Yeah, big learning curve. Yeah. Well, it really sounds like the classic American story: immigrant family. Um, your family really believed in you. Mm -hmm. And you're really self-made, which I think is amazing. Um, uh, what have been some challenges throughout the fashion industry that you've um, encountered throughout the way? Well, I think, you know, in general, I, I definitely don't come from, from a background of fashion. My, mm -hmm. my parents, um, my, my dad is in the agriculture industry. So it's like very, very far. Very different. Very <laughs> different. He specializes in animal feed. <laughs> so that's like the whole opposite. Because there's this like, like everyone's like, oh, are, like is your family in fashion? I was like, really, very, very far. Yeah. From that, so he probably still doesn't understand what you do. No, not really. No. <laughs> you know, it's, um, you walk into off. Just just you, you, you walk into his office, and there's like a big marble sculpture of a pig. <laughs> That's like, he's like obsessed with pigs. So like, wow. literally. And the irony is, I'm allergic to pork. So, <laughs> um, very sad. Um, no bacon true for story you. though, and uh, no. But I think definitely some of the challenges are, you know, I, I came up, I I didn't really, you know, I didn't really know that much, and uh, and you know, I didn't have a lot of money. So, wow. you know, I started using the seed money um, that I got from working in toys. When I was in high school, I like double duty as a, as a toy designer. Oh really? Yeah. It's a like whole what kind of toys? Dolls. Oh. I used to like play with dolls when I was growing up. Ah, so that so kind of surprised me for some reason. I know, <laughs> and, and and you know, so that that was kind of how it all happened. But uh, you know, I, I would say I was way more adventurous back then than I am now. You know. Yeah. yeah. You've had to conform. A little bit. <laughs> um, so let's talk about technology and fashion and how that's changed the industry perspective for you. Um, I'm sure you have to incorporate a lot of social media and technology with your business. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 all changing. Um, I think one one of the things that you know may seem like you know the tech world and what I do is very far apart, but in fact, you know, so much of what we do now is 
reliant on technology, like the way we weave fabric, the way we work with synthetics. Mm -hmm. Everything's, um, you know, when, when fabrics used to be woven, they were kind of all done by hands. So I think how many fibers goes into little threads, goes into the making of a fabric. Wow. That was all done by hand before. So like obviously the productivity level yeah. and also the ability to do things on a more um, advanced way is interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like the garment you're wearing today from my collection, great. It's like, you no, know, it's all laser cut. You know, there's no traditional hem finishing on any of it. Super light, you know, wrink you know, it doesn't wrinkle so much. And you know, it's all just like, synthetics that we're able to play with nowadays, mm -hmm. um, play with different modern finishes. And that's that's what kind of technology has done for us. Yeah. As an industry, we can get more innovative mm -hmm. in terms of um, how we make clothes. Yeah. You know, less literal like light up clothes, but more like how do you make clothes lighter? How do you make them in a more efficient way? Quicker and how do you, efficient. quicker, more efficient, but also just more precise, Yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, well, what about social media? Yeah, I mean, it's fun. I mean, I just recently, like, took up Snapchat, so... You gotta do it. all the kids are Snapchatting. Jason, she's very good. I'm still learning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still I, like, learning I Snapchat a bunch last night, but I was drunk. And I was much... <laughs> and I woke up, and I was, like, doing a W Magazine takeover, and I was like, shit, this morning. I was like, whoa. No, that's not that that. the best snap. I know, they were kind of funny. the real you. Yeah. <laughs> the fun Jason. You know, because I really think, always think I'm like very serious. Yeah. Oh, he's like serious. <laughs> Not serious at all. Well, I also wanted to do this talk with you because we're actually friends. So yeah. it's like, didn't feel like so forced. Yes. I can put on my Oprah hat for you, but like <laughs> the Oprah, like, you know, the serious Fun questionnaire. Oprah I don't think Jess would be very interested in that. Um, yeah, social media takes some getting used to. I yeah. finally just got a Facebook. I've been Snapchatting, Instagramming. But yeah. now I feel like more than ever, it's about creating a brand. <laughs> yeah. You notice that as well. You're. Well, I think that's very interesting. I mean, I think, you know, maybe when, when I met you, you were in just such a, just in the five short years, I feel like modeling has changed. It's changed so a much. Lot. Like for you, right? Like I well, feel when like I first met you, I'd been known more for my catalog work. So yeah. I was really, really excited that you took a chance on me because um, there were many of years I was modeling before. I branched into high fashion and I had to really persevere and take risk and management switch to find an agency that truly believed in me. And then um, one season I went out for shows and Jason was one of the first to believe me and put me in his show. And since then it's all snowballed from there. And um, I feel like we have similar stories that yeah. we believed in ourselves and uh, we persevered. And well, I think it's all important are. with modeling now too. It's like, you know, it used to be, you know, when, it, when I started out, like high fashion was one thing. You had to yeah. be super skinny and like mm -hmm. not, you know, um, almost no personality, like robots yeah. a little bit. Yeah, and I it was think, always hard for me. I always felt like I had to be so serious all the time. Yeah. My agents would tell me, don't be so bubbly. And I'm like, well, and then, and then people would say, oh, she looks like a bitch. I'm like, well, how am I supposed to act? There's no right way to do it. I thought that when I met you. <laughs> yeah, see, um, there we go. <laughs> But um, here I am trying to not see. I'm like giving her a great opportunity. Stop being such a bitch, you know. But um, you know, no. But it was really, really interesting because like I've always loved women, and like I love women with personality and like a point of view. You know, when I met you, it was just really all about like you know the girls of the moment were all girls that looked the same, mostly European, all didn't speak any English. 16. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I lived I, in model apartments with them throughout the world. Yeah, and I just thought, like, you know, I want to dress girls that inspire me. I want to dress girls that are interesting and I can have a real conversation with. Yeah. And like, that's what makes my job interesting because I kind of envision everything I do, every outfit I design for a girl. So, you know, something comes, comes in, I was like, well, you know, like today, I, I gave you one option to wear, is this dress. <laughs> yeah. No, I, ser seriously, because I knew it was going to look great on her. Mm -hmm. We're going to do a red lip, mm -hmm. and we're going to do the hair back like that. It was yes. very, very specific, because <laughs> it looks great on her, mm -hmm. you know? And so you, you, you kind of, it, it, you know, fashion should be curated to everyone's personality. It's not one Thank size, you. it's yeah. not one size fit all, right? Yeah. And I just felt like what was wrong with the industry a lot of the time was that, the, like, these girls were thrust into these, like, crazy fashion environments where, you know, they, they couldn't possibly have a personality. No, of course. You know? And then people always wonder, like, why we don't show our personality in a casting. And it's like, well, you can't even really get to know somebody within five seconds yeah. of meeting them. Like, that takes a while after you've been working together to build a relationship. Yeah. 
Um, but I feel like you came a super long way since, yeah. um, since you, we met. I mean, I think now it's almost essential. Like, you know, there is no such thing as being a commercial model no. or a high fashion model. In fact, it's all about creating a brand and being yeah. more, you know. Well, it's about treating the job like a business. In the beginning, right. um, it's funny, when I first started modeling, it was like, you're supposed to take modeling so seriously. You're not supposed to express interest in other fields. But now it's encouraged to want to do other things, to start a business or act or do all these things. And that's because of social media and because they want you to be become a brand, which I'm actually really enjoying that part. Mm -hmm. um, Technology is really helping shape the arc of my career because social media is giving me a platform to show my personality mm -hmm. and hopefully give fans something to um, be inspired by. I think, you know, I, I don't know, have, I don't know if you ever saw Zoolander 2. <laughs> Did anyone see it? Or else it won't make, no one saw it? Okay, it wouldn't make sense. But it was like a funny line when Penelope, Penelope Cruz was like, you know, I used to be a model, but yes. I have boobs, and <laughs> this is why I couldn't do high fashion. I feel like that line resonated so well within the fashion industry. Yeah, I know, Because we, we it. know that so well. Like, a, it used to be a swimsuit model couldn't be doing high fashion. But now you see the Sports Illustrated models are on the cover of Vogue, and it's all mixed, which yeah. I love that. I yeah. love that we are all about empowering different types of women now. It doesn't have to be this mannequin stick figure anymore. It's really exciting. Speaking with a bunch of mannequins behind us. <laughs> <laughs> Back to pose. Jason Wu's line. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, cool. So what about some other big changes in the industry? Um, I, I don't know. I think it's all, it's all changing, right? Everyone says like faster is better. Mm -hmm. I don't really believe that. I believe that on my phone. I mean, I'm guilty of that, you know, like, if my email doesn't come through for like five seconds, I get really upset. You know? <laughs> but I think we're all guilty of that. Yeah. And uh, we all are kind of, you know, enslaved to the to our phones it's nowadays. True. We're also ADD now. I know, so ADD, like, I can't really sit still. I mean, I never could, but now I really can't. And do you ever imagine just taking a day not looking at your phone? Do no, you ever do that? I can't. Yes. Like, it's like, <gasps> Yeah, that would you know, be like, hard. can't breathe. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure everyone can relate to that. Yeah, it, everyone here probably can relate. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, so like things are like going faster. You know, there's this conversation about, you know, the, fast, the clothes you see on the runway being available right away, things like that. But one thing I would say for me personally, from my point of view, is that I don't think everything has to go the speed of lightning. I do think there's... Um, going to be a, kind of a new focus on things of quality, things that last a long time, and things that don't go out of style so quickly. Mm -hmm. I never considered myself a designer that designed for the season, like the trend of the season. Of course, sometimes we hit trends, um, as we all do, because we're inspired by the world around us. And so that's how kind of trends emerge. Right. You know, um, We don't all meet in a room and decide, you know, if yellow is in this season, mm -hmm. you know, we, you know, what's going on in the world very much affects what we do as a it whole. It happens organically. Exactly. And, but, you know, what's become more important to me now, um, I'm in my 30s and, you know, I've been doing this for a while, is that even though technology is bringing us to the next level in terms of being very fast, being aware of everything that's going on all the time, being stimulated all the time, I do think. I appreciate things of quality even more now. Yeah. You know, like I think about, you know, when I'm buying something for home or I'm buying something um, to wear or, you know, I, I do think about buying something that I can have for a long time, mm -hmm. not something I can just throw away and buy a new one. And so I do think there's going to be um, a renewed focus on that especially when it comes to luxury fashion. I've gone more in that direction with my own style. I look yeah. for really classic pieces. I used to waste so much money on trendy things, and now I just want um, pieces that will stand the test of time and that yeah. will always look nice. And I always think, you know, the world's like a pendulum. You know, it goes back and forth. And so if it goes really fast, mm -hmm. it can go the other way just as fast. Absolutely. You know? I have a personal question. Do you think runway shows will continue? There's been a lot yeah. of talk like, oh, it's 2016. There's got to be a new way to present a fashion collection. And I think there have been attempts. But what do you think will be the best way to showcase new collections in fashion? I mean, I think it's different. You know, like, um, you know, for my, uh, for the Jason Wood collection, I, I think we will go to a more intimate format. Mm -hmm. You know, for a while, a few years ago, it was essential to be a live feed, essential to, you know, to to react. And the truth is, the clothes aren't, aren't really available until six months later. Yeah. So for us, it's more about 
you know, curating a more intimate environment and, uh, and, and cut out all the noise. For me, it's about that. Can I say, as the model, we're always annoyed because when we're walking the show, it's yeah. all we see are phones like this. And we're like, is anybody actually appreciating the moment? No, everyone sees things through phones. Like front nowadays. row is just this the whole time. I know. I'm like, are you, know, you even I, noticing that, what that's I'm actually wearing? Quite, yeah, it's actually quite. Or my walk. <laughs> like one, one season I walked out, I was like, oh my god, people hated the show. No one clapped. Because everyone was on their phone. No one, no one had the time to even pay attention. She's like, oh, did I catch that? And then when Red reveals, oh, I guess people did like it at the end. But like, you would, not, you would, never, like, know. Uh, you would never know. So everyone's... I thought bringing it back to like a small, smaller, like more intimate environment where it feels more like uh, the way they do it in the 50s, you know, where they have like models with cards. I'm not saying to do that, but I do think doing things that are a little bit more special and intimate and curated will have new meaning. Um, especially in the next couple of years, not just in fashion, I think in everything. Yeah. I think it's been very innovative and natural the way you've presented the Grey collection. Yeah. Because Grey for Jason Wu, you launched that at a dinner with friends. Yeah. And I thought that that was really special and unique that you showed it in an intimate s setting rather than blasting it online or in a big print campaign. Yeah. I mean, the reason why I started the collection Grey, it's my um, sister, the sister collection, is that um, I realized a lot of my friends were you know, they can't afford my clothes, you know, it's, you know, it retails at like $1,500 mm. up, you know, like, I'm not even sure if I could honest. afford my own clothes. <laughs> I'd be like, that's expensive, <laughs> you know, so. It took me a lot of years to even think about affording yeah, clothes. it's freaking expensive, but, um, you know, and, and, and so I thought I was... It's looking, art, though. I mean... No, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's it, you art. know, I always said, like, you know, that's, like, my obsession, you know. Um, if um, any of you have been to the Met recently, you can see the craftsmanship. You know, that was a um, technology-themed um, exhibit, but what you see was a lot of handwork. So it really goes hand in hand. So, it's, so, so that, you know, that's what I do a lot with the Jason Wood Collection. You know, I explore techniques. Um, things inspired from Okator techniques. <coughs> things are done by hand. They are, um, it's like creating art, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, for Grey, I really wanted to come up with a collection that was really inspired by my friends, people around me. Um, most of my friends are not in fashion. Um, I'm still like best friends with my high school friends. Oh, and, really? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's awesome. And cool. they're like not in fashion at all. Yeah. But like, or like, you know, you, mm -hmm. or like Diane, or, you know, people I'm around with, women that, that we can wear. Care about clothes, care about style, but you know, want something a little bit more casual, mm -hmm. but also want something that is not disposable yeah. but for a reasonable price. And yeah. I think, you know, women, a lot of my friends are in their 30s, early 30s, late 20s, and that's when you're really starting to look for things to invest in. So that's kind of what I did great for, you know, mm -hmm. almost everything under a thousand dollars. I love that they're very comfortable, but effortless and chic. Like, I could travel in this on the plane and still look nice at the airport, but be very comfortable. Yeah. That's always an issue for me. I'm always traveling all the time, and I don't want to look sloppy while I'm at the airport. Yeah. And sometimes I was actually, I was, I was uh, I, a few years ago, I had to do a project for Team Vogue where I had to, you know, um, take a dress and have to customize it to make it look like something else. And I just wanted, like, a really, really simple dress. But I only had a $30 budget to buy oh. the dress. <laughs> um, that was the whole project, is that you can elevate something. Wow. So I had a $30 budget. Is that what budget. started Inspiration long ago or no? No, no. It was just it's an interesting example, right? Mm -hmm. I was looking for $30 dresses, but every $30 dress I could find had, like, tons of stuff on it. Like, I just really wanted a white, simple something. Yeah, not Those some were all in, like, the 80 friend. $100 range. <laughs> yeah. So it's, like, sometimes, like, the simpler things, things are, like, more timeless or harder to find. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, you know, maybe there is a, some sort of a balance um, to, to, um, to buy something that's affordable, but also has the appeal of something that's um, more, more classic. Yeah, I think that's really important for our culture right now, where we are. When did the development start for this collection? Uh, I started about a year ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think when launching a new brand takes a long time. You know, we had to talk about branding, thinking about, you know, how to, you know, the woven label, how, what we're going to do. What was the name collection? Um, we have to go through, you know, who's the girl? Um, make tons of inspiration boards, go back and forth, um, lots of fittings, cool. fittings all the time. And, uh, and yeah, it's definitely... Definitely a labor of love. How did you come up with the name Gray? Well, Gray is like my favorite color, and um, um, 
And it's like, you know, I think like my whole entire apartment is gray. So mm. my cats are gray, my curtains gray. My curtain, <laughs> Your cats are gray. Everything's gray. <laughs> Everything matches. <laughs> so well, the, the, the point was that to get furniture to match the cat so you don't see the cat hair out everywhere. <laughs> that was actually how is it Is there came a about. bigger meaning with all this gray? Like it's not black or white? Yeah, I mean, I do think that, you know, I think... More subtle? You know, yeah, I mean, I, I do think, especially now we're living in a world of this gray zone right now, you yeah. know? And uh, and I don't think it's black and white, and I think it's good, you know? It's like for you, when you're modeling, you know, used to be commercial board and runway yeah. board, but now there's no such thing. Everyone's doing everything, and mm -hmm. it's better, you know? So I do think we're living in that world right now, where it, those, those kind of... Um, labels don't exist as much mm -hmm. you know um when i was starting out also it was uh very clear things are for runway and things are for commercial purposes well, it's not really like that anymore you know i think um especially for, for me it was never about creating clothes that looked impossible to wear right and then doing something really dumbed down for the customers i think the customers very much want to see what's on the runway, but she also wants to imagine herself in the clothes, you know, so she doesn't really want to, you know, carry wheels on the back, you know, she doesn't really want to, like, look like a clown. Right. <laughs> you know, like... So have you always sort of treated the street as your runway? Well, I like reality. I yeah. mean, I, I, you know, I mean, call me boring, but I always thought it was really nice to be able to see people wear my clothes. That's always been the most interesting thing to me. I remember when I... um about like eight years ago when I first got into Bergdorf Goodman, um, I was walking around on the Upper East Side um, and I saw a girl walk down the street like in a full look. Wow, a full Jason Wood look? A full Jason, Jason Wood look, right? And it was like the first time I'd ever seen somebody wear And by full um, look, that means? Like the top, the top and the skirt and like everything that goes with all it. Jason Wood. I was like very impressed. And, um, <laughs> she, uh, and she was like this pretty young, young thing and she was walking down. And I was like, and I just stopped her. I was like, you look amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she thought it was so freaky. <laughs> You should be like, I made that. <laughs> I know, but it was just like, you know, I was young and it was like, I didn't know what to yeah. say. I was like, ah. Oh. Wow. You know? That must have been a surreal moment for you. Yeah, I it was like great. I that would be the fun part for designers to actually see people wearing their clothes. That must well, be Well, she appealing. spent money yeah. that she could spend on somebody else on my work and she chose to wear it. It makes her feel great. And that is the biggest compliment I that's could what get. That's it's all about. Yeah. You know, and I think that's very important. It's good that you appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you've been using the hashtag Grey La Vie. Yeah. What does that mean to you? Well, it's because the collection is about, you know, what I like, um, my friends, and I like to entertain. I prefer to be home with, like, five, six people and then go out and, like, restaurant. You prefer to be home rather than going out? Yeah. I, like, okay. I love, like, hosting at home, and, like, tonight I'm doing a barbecue. Oh, okay. And, like, just for people that work in my company. Um, and uh, I think those things are really fun. And, again, I think... You know, in this crazy, fast-paced world where everything goes in warp speed and things are becoming more and more impersonal, Absolutely. Um, I think I'm starting, I appreciate the times where I can get to know people, I can get to talk to people. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, how many times have we been together to yeah. big dinners yeah. in those, like, crazy... Um, ballrooms in hotel rooms or those like fancy dinners where like you know the meat is stale the fish is overcooked yeah it's true you know and like and everyone leaves before dessert is even served you know so true. and it's like what's the point of all like that? everyone's going there just for press yeah. yeah and it was just like i prefer to show face. have dinner with like six people yeah i've always loved that about you it's always been about forming a real connection and that's hard yeah. to find in the industry it's also yeah. hard to find loyalty so it's so great that you've been yeah so loyal to me you know what I'm going to be loyal at? Like, this cafeteria is in this building. <laughs> I know. That's amazing. Pizza. I was it hoping... It's not like Pizza Hut when I walked I know. So I, I heard there's also, like, a sushi place and, like... Is there like a Thai Thai place also? Like pizza? <laughs> no Chinese, sir. So we're going we're, we're gonna to go around afterwards and, like, yeah. go to all the cafeteria. I'm so hungry right now. <laughs> so jealous. <laughs> um, so I think it's about time that we take some questions from the audience. Any right? questions? Questions, anybody? Hey, Jason. Hi. Um, hey, uh, my name is Vivian. I'm an MBA intern here this summer. 
Uh, I was kind of curious. So over the last two years, there's been a greater emergence of Asian American voices, especially in media and entertainment, which is not really the case for when I was growing up. Yeah. Um, given that fashion has been such a great enabler in promoting social change and innovation and new ideas out there, what do you think your role is in enabling more Asian American but also underrepresented voices out there in the media? I mean, the truth is, um, and we didn't talk a lot about that, but um, I moved to Canada when I was nine, and not because I wanted to, because I didn't want to leave my friends. I, I grew up in Taiwan, and uh, and I always like play with dolls, and like my brother was very macho, like play with like Nintendo and like trucks. <laughs> I play with Barbies, you know, like. <laughs> That's what I preferred. It was I so, can't see you and, with like building blocks in a no, truck. No, I prefer like braid hair. Yeah. You know, and like that was more fun. <laughs> and and uh, and you know, it's funny to talk about it nowadays. But you know, in the '80s in Taiwan, it was really not very acceptable. People thought it was very very weird, and people thought it was really quite socially unacceptable. You know, I got made fun of a lot. Um, and even within pe people in my own family, like, people would thought it was really inappropriate. My parents were really cool about it. They always kind of, they just bought me whatever I wanted wow. to play with, you know? Wow. And so That's the impressive. reason my mom decided to send myself and my brother to, to Canada was that it would give us a much more open-minded environment to, to grow. Wow. And, um, and growing up in Asia, I mean, um, you mentioned uh, Asian American. Um, you know, I think in the 80s, early 90s, uh, we were all expected to go into a business, some yeah. sort of a business role. And creativity wasn't really appreciated or embraced. So, um, so through amazing parents and amazing people I met throughout my life, I've been able to um, succeed doing exactly what I wanted to do. Wow. So um, what I do now, I, um, I think the world is a much different place. Taiwan is a very different place. Asia mm -hmm. is a different place. But um, I do a mentorship program with a... Uh, Taiwanese college, fashion college. Yeah. So um, I do. Uh, I host six kids a season where they come here, they get to work with me for the entire season, and you know they have a great resume. They get to learn a lot, and uh, and I can help um, change the perception that creative industries aren't to be taken seriously. But again, the All world's changing. a much better place right yeah. now. It's a much different place, and. Uh, and I think I'm happy things have changed. Absolutely. See, it all starts with the parents. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pooja. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, 10 years ago doesn't seem like that long ago. And I'm just curious, when you were first starting out, who was influential in your career? And what advice did they give you that really stuck with you? I think my mom was really like very, very, very influential to me. She, she's, you know, you know, when you're younger, like, you know, I remember, like, when, when we were younger, I was just always thought I knew everything. And they just like smack me across the head. <laughs> I, I was like, you know nothing. You know nothing. Mm -hmm. And true. And like that's the best advice I've ever been I've been never given. It's like, okay, actually, you always go into an environment, a new situation, thinking that you know nothing. Because you know, the kind of things you can learn if you just get rid of that mental block Absolutely. is amazing. And you know, I learned from like the kids that work for me, the interns, I learn from um, my friends, like you, like, you know, what you do on a daily basis, what's important to you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have a foundation uh, that you work with the foundation. Yes. Um, and uh, so just learning different things is really good. And to not, like, don't be an asshole. <laughs> don't think, don't think you know person. it all. No, and don't no, always like, believe social media because everything no, is like, just like, perfect all the time. Be a little bit more down to earth. Yeah. <laughs> be grounded. Hi. Hi, Jason. I'm Desmonique. I work on one of the advertising sales teams here. One, some of the clients I work with are in the retail space. Yeah. And as you know, retail is seeing a decline in foot traffic, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of talk about rethinking the retail space for different kinds of shopping environments to yeah. bring people in. I'm curious, since you've probably shopped around the world, have you been in a place recently that has been kind of indicative of how you think the shopping experience should be redefined for today's consumer in fashion? And what are your thoughts about how you would like your clothes experienced at point of sale? Well, I think it's very interesting because I'm, you know, this is where, you know, me, I, I shop online. 
you know, like I shop <laughs> online. We'll tell them that. <laughs> Every, no, I love to shop online. You know, it's easy. I get, you know, it's easy. It's convenient. But I love going to stores, but now for a whole different reason. I'm not going to go to a store to buy something just to buy something. When I go into a retail space, I want to have an experience. And I think what you're going to see, like what I said about clothing, is that the retail experience has to be special. The customer experience has to be special. And I would say, like, you know, some of the best stores I've ever been to, when you go in, you don't feel like you're in a store. You're, you're going into a home, a living room. Yes. You know, and uh, I think that's, that's going to be very, very important. Because you're getting out of your house, you, you, when you want to go somewhere, you want to make sure that it's an experience. You want to make sure it's enjoyable and special, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's what you can't get on the internet. You know, that can't be replaced. But um, so we, all, I think as we, I mean, I'm opening my first shop within the Saks Fifth Avenue this, um, this August. Oh, congratulations. And, thank you. And, and you know, when, when people buy a, buy a dress, you know, it's personalized, you know, engraved in their name and things like that, little gestures like that. Mm -hmm. I make it very special. Like when, when I do dinners, I always have place settings with calligraphy name of every guest, you know, or something like that. Those little gestures just make things so much more personal. Because, you know, we don't need to go anywhere if we don't want to. No. You know? I mean, between We're all like, busy. Everyone here know, is busy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, between like all my apps, I can get whatever I want in the city whenever I want yeah. at home. You can't. So you know, true. I got order ice cream one day because like from Postmates. Yeah. Because like yeah, just Postmates one. Postmates is my life. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And uh, so you don't need to do anything. So we, I think retailers have to think about things differently. Also, going to a store, you can go with friends and family, and that makes it more of an experience. It has to be an you experience. To shop with friends. Yeah. Something you don't really do online. And it has nothing to do with price point or any specific type of things. But I think when you go into a store where it feels warm, cozy and welcoming and interesting and curated versus kind of this idea of, you know, this supermarket idea, you know? Mm -hmm. It's different. Absolutely. Any other questions? Hi, um, Hi. I'm Apoorva. I'm an engineering intern. I had a question. You touched upon it a little bit, but how fashion is moving towards more of like for all women and not just size zero and just it seems like from an outside perspective it's still not really for a woman of every size a woman of every color i mean these mannequins don't really have attainable proportions mm -hmm. and so <laughs> um can you talk more about just how like some tangible things where fashion is moving towards being inclusive of everyone. Well, I think it's, yeah, I mean, yes, these girls are not the best representations, I agree. Um, they were just what's available for today. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, no, I think that it's, it's interesting, right? I think standards of beauty have changed significantly. And I think we are seeing a shift of that. Like, you know, not everyone looks the same. And as I said, people are embracing women with different personalities, different ethnic backgrounds, and different uh, different sizes. You know, I, I think that's that's very important. I think social media in between, uh, you know, you just, you know, whereas I think before it was a very closely guarded, I, I wouldn't even just say fashion is, I would say everything was a closely guarded thing where, you know, things are selective for you yeah. by like a small group of influential people. But now with social media, you get people that are more unlikely able to be in a public eye yeah. um, that are in the public eye, yeah. you know? So you're I don't know if that makes any sense. You know, like, you know, you know, so you see a very wide range of different girls in fashion magazines now where you wouldn't have before because, you know, these girls are powerful and people relate to them yeah. on their own. So the magazines don't have to feature them now, you know? They're not selected in a room by a group of people anymore. Yeah. In fact, people are selecting for the magazines. Yeah. And I think that's a big difference. Yeah. You know? Um, I think that's it's 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 the one thing that's changing everything. Yeah, and there's plenty of empowered, curvy women out there that are yeah. um, helping shape fashion. Also, the runway's always, to me, seem like a fantasy. And what you see yeah. in fashion campaigns, it's more like 
it's artistic, it's a fantasy. It's not necessarily yeah. like something you aspire to as like your body type. You know, you have to embrace what you have. Yeah. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jason. Thanks Hi. for coming today, and sure. Martha too. Um, I love your collaboration with uh, Melissa Shoes. I'm actually wearing one pair. I love today. those. Uh, I have like three <laughs> pairs. I love them, and I really. Uh, was excited when I discovered these shoes actually when I was in Australia. I love what Melissa does, and you know, all their shoes are all her shoes are recyclable. And yeah, you know, um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about you know your views and your thoughts on sustainability and fashion and, and collaborating with um, with a group like Melissa. Well, I think it's a fine balance. You know, I think you know, it's really not black and white, right? I think I use a lot of natural materials. You know, a lot of wools. I was actually just in Sydney last week where, you know, I went to the wool farms. You know, I got to shear sheep. Oh, yeah. It was, like, it was much more fun in my imagination. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, they move, and they're really strong, and they're, like, aggressive. I don't even see you on a farm. I don't like, either. How did you survive on a sheep First farm? First of all, never go with shoes you like. <laughs> Destroyed afterwards. Did your dad give you some tips before you went? <laughs> there you no, go. No, I mean, you know, I was just like going and I was like going to visit the wool farms. I was doing a project with um, Walmart and, and so we went to see it. So, you know, you can see la that, you know, with natural, there's something that's so beautiful about natural materials that I don't think can ever be replaced. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's very ethical ways to source these materials. I think that's very important to always know your sources. I think, you know, whether, you know, you are on the vegan side or not on the vegan side, there, there, there are proper channels to source all materials. And same thing with um, synthetics. You know, it's about making things that are um, like the Melissa shoes that can last a long time, that are produced in factories that are very, very um, well equipped to deal with um, plastics and you know very ethical. Ethical, yeah. Meanwhile, like you know, there's a lot of things out there that that you know, you know, just because it's you know it's vegan, just because it's sustainable, doesn't mean it's actually good for the environment either. So it's it's kind of a you know I, I don't know if I'm answering it correctly, but I think no, it's sense. all contextual. Like I think we always have to um, be very aware of where our sources are and what their effects are. You know, and to make sure that you're using the best version of that. Thank you. Thank you. Did I answer that right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know. It's all relative. <laughs> uh, hi, Jason. Thank you for coming. Um, likewise, I wanted to wear something today that's made by you, but it's. I have one thing. It's a leather dress, and I figured, you know, for a Thursday, it might be a, lo a little bit of an overkill here. <laughs> <laughs> that's ever, okay. Ever. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, Look, my I question. dressed up today. Well, that's I'm actually kidding. my question. You, you talked about your interviewer's dress, hair, makeup even, you mm -hmm. know, how you selected everything. Can you talk about your style? My how style you is this. How do you select what you do? Well, why? It's black, how do you select? navy, gray, three colors, no hair, because <laughs> I really don't have time. Like, this is my, my job, is to make other people look great. I'm a much better behind the scene person than in front. And so I really have a uniform. You know, and I'm like very uninteresting in terms of my style. It's like white sneakers, black sneakers, black t-shirt, navy t-shirt, or maybe it's a gray one. <laughs> you know, those are very big decisions I have to make every day. Always a t-shirt, that's true. Or a sweater in the winter. But I feel like this is very common. <laughs> I do that. In the industry. Oftentimes you see stylists dress down. Sneakers, yeah. t-shirts, jeans, and I think it's because they treat their work like their art, and that's what they're passionate I, about, but at home, they don't really care. I just care, like I care about making her look great. I don't really care how Lucky I look, me. you know? Like I, I just wanna, you know, I wanna be presentable, but you know, I, I, I keep it really simple. Yeah, simple's good. It's not about me. Hi, I'm Emily. Um, I actually have a question more specified towards Martha. Um, with your social media, you have a couple million followers, which is extremely impressive. Um, but I've, I've always kind of wondered, you know, what that decision-making process is like in terms of what you post um, professionally and exposing yourself to so many followers and what you keep private for yourself. 
That's an interesting question because sometimes I do I do wonder like should this be private? But um, I do notice that the viewers want to see as much of your personality as possible. So I do try to share certain private moments because that is relatable and that is me. Like I try to share my dog or my boyfriend once in a while or me cooking because that's really who I am. And it looks like I'm made up in all these fabulous destinations all the time, but people should take it all with a grain of salt because it is curated. And Instagram is sort of like the final image. That's how you want to present yourself to the world. But you don't see a lot of you know what's really going on all the time. And I'm not going to bash a job if it's not going well on Instagram. So you're just going to see me looking great. <laughs> but um, I do think it is a little bit deceiving that things look so great all the time. Don't, I mean, I'm very appreciative of my life and all that. But um, there's this thing in culture now where I feel like everyone's feeling this fear of missing out. And I just want to remind people that you know it's, it's all a fantasy. Models eat, too. <laughs> yes. We're going to have pizza. Yes. And I also try to show that I work out a lot, because I think it's important to motivate people. That helps people get inspired to get to the gym. And um, it takes a lot of work to maintain my figure. And I'm, I'm not trying to act like, oh, I eat whatever I want, and I'm just, you know, tall and thin and all that. Like, I definitely work out and work for it. I think that's been more of a trend, though, of people kind of, like, a lot of models being more open about that and about yeah. how you know, how much work it takes to eat healthfully, to, you know, especially while traveling and your lifestyle is so demanding and like, you know, that's hard for someone going to work at the same job every single day in yeah. one place, let alone traveling all over the world and not having any of your comforts around. Understandably, um, yeah. So it's nice that there's like so much exposure there. Yeah. I mean, you and Carly like inspire me to go work out. You know, I always tell you, you guys are always <laughs> yeah. so worked out. I finally got my ass always, back in the gym yeah. this year. <laughs> Everything's wrong. But there's also a tremendous amount of pressure to post. Sometimes I feel like, oh, I feel like I'm so annoying doing putting all this content out there. But we're all we're also getting pressure from our agencies. Like we need more content, show your personality, because it's designers like Jason who are casting girls that have a following. It's become such a key role in our industry. Yeah, so important. Yeah, it's so important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I have a question about kind of um, dressing celebrities. You talked a little bit about seeing the person walking down the street on the Upper East Side and that yeah. gave you joy. But then how do you reconcile, like, when we talk about award seasons and mm -hmm. all these different big events and you have very high profile people wearing your clothes, like, what does that feel like? Is that the same level? Is that the same level of joy or... Um, is that not as important to you anymore? Because I think like, you've dressed first ladies and all of that. Like, is there like an aspirational piece? Like, I want to dress this person, but it's also interesting to see normal people wearing my clothes. Like, I think it's both. I mean, I think it's different. I love seeing people wear my clothes in general. It's two very different things, right? Um, you know, when when I love seeing, I, you know, I, I go to stores all the time. I interact with my customers. I dress them, and I suggest. You know, like I'm, you know, I'm very blunt. So if like something doesn't look good on her, I would just say don't buy it. Even, you know, it's like, you know, I'm very, I love that process of working with people and making them feel great and look amazing. And seeing my work on them makes me feel very good. Um, award season is different. You know, for me, you know, from a, I would say, a small brand point of view, um, you know, when, you know, a lot of what Red Carve has become is kind of product placement. And, uh, and a lot of actresses are endorsing brands. And you know, for me, for my own brand, m you know, almost I was saying all the actresses and people I dress are people I have like a relationship with. So to me, it becomes about uh, me helping them accomplish something at a moment that's important to them. You know, me making them look the best. And so it's, it's a little bit more personal for me. And it makes me feel very proud. You know, if, you know, a friend of mine wins something and she's wearing my design, you know, I feel like, you know, I, I, I feel like part of the success. So it's my, 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 my goal has always been more a personal one, I guess. So, yeah, I still get a rush seeing something very public happen, something, you know, I'm very proud of my friend for doing and that I can be a part of that through making her look great. Could you share an example of a friend that you were really excited that you got yeah. to dress in an exciting moment? I mean, you know, Carrie Washington, she's been my friend for like, she's actually one of the first actresses to ever wear me. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, and uh, so I met her about like nine years ago. She's stunning. And you know, um, 
couple years ago, she was going to the Oscars and she was pregnant for, with her first baby, and she was people were just you know, you know, it was really her moment, and people were she was presenting, and people were just you know throwing everything at her. But three months, and this is very rare, like three months before the Oscars, she asked me to make her dress, and she never changed her mind. Wow. You know, and that sounds maybe not sound like so much right now, but honestly, actresses get so much given to them that like, you know, they can change their mind at any moment mm -hmm. in the last minute. And she, you know, she did that. And it was really like a very special moment. Yeah. What about dressing the first lady? How is that like? It's amazing. I mean, to be able to, you know, for me as an Asian American person, to Asian American Canadian person, to uh, <laughs> to you know to be an immigrant, to be the first you know Asian person to dress the first African American first lady <laughs> is super significant to me. Like I never imagined that that's something I would be able to be a part of. Like I wanted to be in Vogue, you know, <laughs> and I didn't think like I. But after that experience, I started thinking so much bigger. Like thinking about like how. You know, like How many there's more so much boxes. Can you tick? You know, I mean, no, it just it, it just kind of humbled me a lot. Yeah. Hello, hey, um, thanks so much for being here. This is great. Um, my name is Bilal. Um, I had a question around um, the price point. You mentioned earlier that even sometimes you think you can't afford your own clothes, right? Yeah. Um, and I understand completely that you know, good quality craftsmanship and materials and design, etc., in any field, whether that's clothing or food or anything, costs a lot of money. Have you ever thought about trying to adapt your lines in the future um, to be more accessible from a you know, price point perspective? Well, I just launched Grey, which is a oh. collection that is much more accessible. And uh, you know, price point between like $150 to like $800 you know, for like an outerwear piece, for example. Yeah. You know, so that's definitely like a different price range for me. But yeah. um, you know, it's, still, you know, it's, it's still pricey, but I think it's you know, also made with an understanding that um, that it's clothes you can keep for a long time. You yeah. know, it's not throwaway. They're classic pieces. They're yeah. classic investment pieces. You know, they give you fashion, but there's still like a uh, timelessness. Yeah. About. And I'm just curious on that. What what needs to be changed to actually bring the price point down? Like, what are the elements that actually... Well, a lot of different adapted? things, you know. Like, I think, you know, look, it's, it's also just very different kind of clothes for me. Yeah. And look, if you see these pieces, these are from collection, these two are from gray. You know, these are much more day. They're much easier to wear, um, casual shapes. Here, this is very expensive because it's a down jacket made with a, this feather voile fabric and it's hand embroidered um, over like a thousand hours, little feathers encrusted on with beads. If you look at the craftsmanship of that, that's the difference. I'm not gonna be able to bring that for like, you know, a different price point, but that's my obsession, you know, the art of creating something so painstakingly made that it's just, you know, sometimes beyond reason. But thanks. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jason, my question is actually very related um, to the last one. It's about, so there's a certain warmth to handmade clothing, yeah. whereas a lot of times technology kind of gets the stigma of being very cold. Yeah. What techniques did you use in your collection to make the clothes still very special and warm? I mean, you know, everything I make is made by hand. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a certain, you know, I'm, I, I'm a true believer in that. Like, I, 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 you know, I'm not very good at drawing on the computer. Um, I'm much better at drawing by, by hand. So I'm a very hand-oriented person. I do think that's something mm -hmm. that will probably never change for me. So yeah, but I mean, definitely, you know, to use technology um, in fashion doesn't mean you take away the hand. You know, you can laser cut a fabric. You can treat it with some sort of an interesting coating to either change the appearance or texture of the fabric or the function of the fabric. You know, those are things that could be very beneficial um, through using technology. But the truth is, there's still really no such thing as machine-made fashion. Even the t-shirt that I'm wearing or something that you think is machine-made, the pair of hands still has to put it through the machine. Like, it doesn't okay. really exist. Good point. Like, there's no such thing as a machine-made fashion, really. Not yet, you know, and... So uh, robots are putting... Yeah, no, I mean, if you, you know, if something as simple as this, it's still made by her hands. It's true, that's a good point. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's all we have time for. Thank you for having us. Thank you guys so much for having us. It was such an honor. Thank you.